Hi, everyone. Um, I'll just give everyone a second to join in because um, the number one complaint I get is um, that I start talking straight away and some people take a, a moment to join in. So I'll just give everyone a minute. Uh, here we go. Hey, Jason, hopefully you can see me live now. So um, the live is going simultaneously on the 8 p.m. Facebook page. Hello, everyone, if you're watching. Uh, 8 p.m. Inner Circle, where all of our customers are usually hanging out, drinking and discussing um, interesting drums. It's also going live on my personal Instagram page, Facebook page, my personal one, and more importantly, on LinkedIn. Um, so I've been psyching everyone up all day. Um, I was feeling a bit low because I had kind of planned on doing a, like a circuit of whiskey tastings. And I was thinking of this back in February before the whole coronavirus situation unfolded. Um, and uh, the thought was that, you know, we could sort of do a, like a week long uh, journey by doing like a Monday or a Tuesday night, Auckland, maybe Tauranga, Hamilton, Wellington, or maybe even a Christchurch whiskey tasting. And by maybe finishing either in Auckland or in Hamilton on the Saturday, so doing four or five tastings, build it up, build it up. But um, yeah, well, that's not going to happen. But with the situation changing with um, New Zealand, obviously dropping down to lockdown level number two, and there was still a possibility to do maybe even one in Hamilton, but um, the venues don't know, you know, can you do events or can you not? So I thought, let's just leave it alone. Um, there's a lot, you know, the... The country's gone through. Everyone has become quite accustomed to the whole video thing. So I'll just do a live and um, we'll make a piece with it. So I'm going to kick it off um, by drinking an Irish whiskey. And I thought long and hard, and I've got like a collection of whiskeys just here. Um, I thought long and hard, what should I start on? You know, because I intend to drink whiskeys on camera from a few different countries. And um, it's often debated, you know, who really started the whiskey and there's lots of written texts and all that kind of stuff. But loosely, what I've heard is, you know, it was the Irish monks that sort of had some sort of distillation or something that could be closely related to a modern day whiskey. So Irish whiskey. And uh, I don't want to start a controversy by people commenting saying, hey, you're wrong, it was this or that. But in my mind, it's these guys who started it. So the first whiskey I'm going to be trying is the Method and Madness um, Single Malt, which is a very interesting range, um, quite often misunderstood. So this is made by Middleton Distillery, which also does some really other cool stuff. But this is kind of like the name suggests Met, uh, Method and Madness. It is their... Bit of wonky, a little bit of sort of how do I say it? You know, I mean, we've become sort of accustomed to having single malts with eight statements. And if memory serves me right, Meg, who's a New Zealand Irish whiskey ambassador for Jamison's and Red Breast, who also make this whiskey, I'm pretty sure she told me this is a 14 year old single malt. And you know, we normally don't see long aged Irish whiskies, and it's just bizarre they don't put an age statement on there. So this one is finished in French limousine oak cask. So started its life in bourbon cask, which imparts that light, fruity, honey, um, vanilla sort of character. Can everyone hear me okay? If someone can get, either give me a comment or, um, yep. And please, I will keep cruising through the comments on all of the channels. If you can, uh, please tell me what you are drinking because I'm deeply interested in that. Uh, it's not all about just, what I'm drinking, but I'm also keen to know what you guys are drinking. Oh, Tabitha is having a Talisker Storm. Cool. What are you drinking, Keith, Stephen, and Jason? Perfect. Thanks for confirming that you can hear me. And let's see what the LinkedIn guys are doing. Hi, Verandra. Thank you for joining. Hmm. Oh, wow. So one of the things that strikes me about Irish whiskey is its light and fruity character. Being triple distilled, it's just so easy to drink. And that's the comment what friends and family always make. You know, I like Irish whiskey. 
because it's easy to drink, it's light and fruity. But with this one, having been having that sort of second maturation, there's a lot more of the oak character than usual. Wow. But still quite sweet, quite, I don't want to say perfumey, but quite fragrant. Um, quite fragrant, but it's not fresh like a space side, you know, where it has the tropical fruit character. Mmm. Oh, so good. Well, cheers to everyone who's watching um, and is celebrating World Whiskey Day. Mmm. <laughs> so quite sweet but there's just um the oak is there mm. Mm. and just uh it's funny like um i remember drinking it last time and i could find a lot of honey but maybe that's my first dram tonight um no honey if anything finally get just a little dry where we have they put tasting notes on here anyway no they haven't mm, floral note yep so i was right about that cracked cinnamon stick ice cream cone wafer there we go that's a tasting note i've never said before <laughs> ice cream cone wafer wow I was right about uh, yeah that's i think i kept saying oak but um the bottle says to finish um toasted what does it say toasted barley mm, it's there it's a little bit of cereal as well quite nice um it's quite expensive uh, for a no age statement irish single malt you know you can get a teeling single malt for 85 dollars 87 dollars and this one's 130, 140. But like I said, I have a good authority um, that this one is 14 years old or up to 14, maybe. Hopefully, Megan will watch the video and correct me. Cool. That's one country already done. Ireland done. Hey, Jonathan. Hi, Ollie. Hi, Vane. Raj is drinking Dinks in 12. Raj, I hope you're okay, mate. I haven't caught up with you in a little while. Hope you're okay uh ardmore which ardmore ollie and tim's drinking a glenfiddich 15 and then he's going to have a game to throw in oban and then he's going to finish on the abola good choice man cool sounds like everyone's having fun woodford reserve double oak love it so the reason why i started the video a couple of minutes late is um i was trying to find a nice bourbon to drink and I have self-professed for not having tried many interesting bourbons, but I'm fixing it really, really quick. Um, lots of friends and family are sending me samples. Um, the industry reps and you know um, suppliers, they send me samples as well. And I've been learning quite a lot, but I still am not committing to buying my own open bottles or opening a bottle for myself because I don't drink bourbon as often, but it intrigues me. So the one I was gonna drink on the camera is this one here which is not a huge seller but um i remember drinking it five years ago maybe four and a half years ago and actually i found it quite interesting um it's bottled at 40 percent abv um and um i remember it being quite earthy having a really dry earthy character which is what i've enjoyed about bourbons quite often um, I'm not a big fan of that sort of um, corn-driven sweet bourbons. Um, and that's for the reason I'm happy to say that on camera. Like, never been a big fan of Jim and Jack's. Um, I like Jack's Single Barrel. That's beautiful. And I like some of the older beans. But the young stuff, not as much. I'm not 100% sure how old this would be. Um, but it's just got a beautiful natural color to it. Look at that. That's just gorgeous. And that retails for around $70. And um, Stevens just commented, um, good entry-level bourbon, which is interesting, right? A lot of people would think entry-level bourbon should be about 35, 40 bucks, which is the Jim Beam White. But that's probably a good mixing bourbon.
But what I would say is this is a very good entry level sipping bourbon. Um, well, let's get in there. Mm. Now, Jason, I won't be posting notes. I think tonight's going to be a bit of fun. It's going to be rapid fire. I have nine whiskeys to go through, but I'm more than happy to chat with you one on one later on and we can discuss. Oh, just beautiful. Quite nice. The other thing I've been quite intrigued by is rye uh, whiskeys out of states, but. Again, none in the house because I get some samples and I drink them. You can see the Jack Daniel rye. Is that the rye? Oh, no, that's the Legacy Edition. I had the Jack rye. That was all right. Um, quite liked the... Um, is that... I'm having a moment now. Uh, what was that rye? It'll come back to me. It'll come back to me. There was a very interesting cast strength for your rye I had the other day. Templeton, sorry. Templeton for your rye. And the six year old, it was quite nice as well. But this uh, Basil Hayden. Hmm. Quite nice. And um, hey, good day to friends or colleagues who I probably haven't met yet on Instagram. This is my first ever live on Instagram doing these. And my camera is <laughs> sideways. I kind of assume putting on tilt will fix it. So if you're getting the video on the sideway, um, I'm very sorry. I'm not drunk. Um, it's just how the camera is. Hmm. Very nice. Quite approachable on the nose. Um, quite often the entry level bourbons, you know, just too perfumey, too sweet. This is good. There's a good amount of oak on the nose. All right, let's try this. Mm. And there it is. A really earthy sort of. And you taste a little bit of rye in there as well. But it's just nice. The only problem I've got with the Basil Hayden is, which is what I have with a lot of Scotch whiskeys as well, or Irish whiskey, or any whiskey that's bottled at 40% now is my taste buds are absolutely spoiled because I drink far too much car strength whiskeys and I struggle to get joy out of whiskeys at 40%. They seem watery, they seem very, very light and it's got moments of joy in there, but it's disappearing off the palate very, very quickly, which could be different for you if you don't drink as much neat whiskey or car strength whiskeys as me. Um, the 40% will still give you lots of amazing character and you might yet add a little bit of water in there. Cool. What did Keith say? No ice. Never ice. I did a whole video on YouTube about it. But hey, that time when I did the no ice or ice, I did a... Um, a cheap smoky blend and actually it tasted better with the ice and now i'm not saying the whiskey wasn't good before and the ice made it better but um the logic behind it is um i mean i drink for flavors and smells hopefully you do as well um and the ice will always inhibit both the smell and the flavor you know the cooler you make it um it will start to inhibit the flavors um if anything, if you want your neat whiskey to give it, give you the full blown effect on the nose and palate, you want it to be warm. You want to be gripping your glass, whatever shape or size it is, as tight as you can. So the heat from your hand um, or your body is transferring to the whiskey and it starts to open up. But if adding ice in there makes it easier for you to drink it, do it by all means. Um, that's absolutely fine. Mm. What are you two drinking, Jason? I didn't see before. Yep, big fan of Maker's Mark. I will show you something cool. Um, Rory, hopefully, if he's watching. Oh, uh, what have I done with this bottle? He um, he gave me a wee sample of a Maker's Mark. What did he say? It was a single barrel, hand-filled sample at the distillery. So Rory is the brand ambassador for a whole bunch of distilleries in New Zealand. 
Uh, he looks after the Bean Suntory uh, portfolio. Brilliant guy if you run into him at a trade show. Um, and Maker's Mark, love it. Especially the cast strength, Maker's Mark, really, really good. Unfortunately, we only get the tiny 375 ml bottle um, in New Zealand. I did say um, that I'll share some stories, and I'll share a story with you about the Maker's Mark cast strength. Um, my first experience with it was um, when we went for a holiday to Australia, to Gold Coast. Me and my wife and my two little kids, we stayed at this beautiful resort um, in Surface Paradise. You know, very kid friendly. They had their own play area and the pool and all that kind of stuff. And I remember being in the hotel room at about eight, quarter to eight at night, thinking to myself, this is not what I do when I've come to Gold Coast in the past. This, there surely has to be something else I have to do because my kids and my wife had already gone to sleep being tired from day's activities. And I'm sitting there by myself. So I put Netflix on and I had a bottle of the Makers Mark Car Strength um, I had brought with me. It was gifted to me. And over the next three nights, that kept me sane <laughs> because all of my previous experiences of having been in Gold Coast, being for conferences, for um, stag parties, or just enjoyment. And that went on till four in the morning. But that Makers Mark Car Strength literally kept my sanity. All right. What else would be there? Is older or is better? Or it depends on brand. Um, Liz, that's very debatable, right? I mean, if I had to guess, this is five to eight years old, and it's actually quite nice, you know, and I've had older bourbons, and they're just wonky, never make sense. So what you got to keep in mind is what is being put into the bottle, you know, if you talk about Scott Single Malt, uh, yep, it's a Scott Single Malt, all the whiskey came from one distillery, but this still could be of different ages or could be of different barrels uh, types, so they don't specify. So it could be, um, could be. It's very debatable, and it's I think up to the individual palate as well. Um, I mean, I've tried some very uninteresting, very expensive 30, 35 year old Scotch whiskies, just had no legs in it. It was dead. Versus a cast strength, twelve year old, and a Rosso sherry cast like a Benria, and it just, <laughs> it's just a. Full flavor blast. Mm. All right. Let's see what other people are saying. Cool. It's good to hear. Raj, you're doing okay, but we'll catch up. Uh, yeah, I like rye. Right? Why cannot not why cannot remember the name of that whiskey? What's the rye whiskey I was drinking? What's the name of that whiskey? Um, I can't remember. It will come to me, hopefully. Um, what are the LinkedIn people up to? Is it any of you guys watching? Are you too tired from the politics of the week? Cool. Hi, Sam. And Andrew, going to grab the whiskey you sent me last week. Open that baby up, buddy. You'll like it. Sweet. All right. What should I drink next? Mm, I'll do this one, which might surprise most people. I bet half of you haven't even heard of it. This is Bain's um, single grain whiskey from South Africa. A fantastic under $50 or around $55 retail. We don't always sell it on 8 p.m. because there's not a huge demand for it. But um, a good friend of mine, Rovan in Tauranga, um, he sent me, well, half a bottle to try. It's actually very nice whiskey for the money. If I ever had to do a segment, you know, <laughs> top picks on unusual whiskeys under 60 bucks, that'd be number one. Very light in color. So probably not all malted barley. There we go. So there's probably a little bit of corn in there, or quite a lot of corn. But I remember drinking it first time, and it's like, it's got legs. It's got a powerful nose. And on the palate, it actually lingers for a long time, despite being at 
Um, I don't know a lot about the distillery it, it is made. I've just never bought it. It's actually 43%, but I've always been very pleasantly surprised by that. If any of you have tried it before, please leave a comment. Mm. Beautiful. Very nice. Far superior to some entry level scotch blends at around the same price of 50 to 55 dollars i know we all are very spoiled by um the johnny walker black the wondrous amazing entry level amazing um blend but this is good get a bottle highly recommend it i'll see if we, we can get some more to sell i think i saw some today but I've just never focused on it because no one expects, I guess, a whiskey from South Africa. All right. Before I move on to one of my all-time favorite Scotch blends, I'll just do another round of the comments. Cool. Just so happy people are watching and engaging and the content because um i mean ideally this would have been one-on-one -on -one, you know 30 40 50 people at a time but this works it's okay and i'm glad you guys are drinking amazing quality stuff at home as well mm. cool and what are people saying on 8 p.m Um, Anj, Glenfiddich 18, all day. It's my favorite from Glenfiddich. Love it. I just hope one day they will bottle just one, just for me, an 18-year-old at car strength. I think it will be magic. Um, it's just a shame the water is down. And I understand, you know, it's bottled for the mass market. And I still love the Glenfiddich 18. It's one of my all-time favorite single malts. Um, but it just lacks, like I said before, being at 40, 43%, it just, it it starts to take you on a ride and then it kind of just leaves you roadside. That's not nice. No one wants to be left roadside. People want to get to the destination. Um, and quite often I would start on the Glenfiddich 18 or sort of like a mid-flight and then move on to something else a lot more robust, which is not nice. Cool. Stephen, what dollar-wise would you say is good entry-level scotch? Can you define 50, 60 bucks? All right. Cool. Cheers to you, Wayne. <laughs> I'm not going to try and say your last name because people make a mistake with mine. But Wayne, great minds think alike. I love the Johnny Green. It's beautiful whiskey. Now... We did a whiskey tasting in Auckland um, at Good Home Mount Eden. This is probably last year or early last year. And we did the full Johnny Walker range from the red label to the blue and the five in the middle. And the three comments we got unanimously from everyone who attended was that Johnny Walker red is actually a very nice whiskey if you drink it for what it's worth. For $45, you're getting served a very nice whiskey. And... I kind of laugh and I actually play along the joke, oh, Johnny Red, ugh. but it's actually very nice. You know, take the time to drink it neat sometime, let it warm it up, let it open up a little. It's actually fantastic entry-level Scotch whiskey. It's absolutely fine. And it's a bargain. You're getting a liter bottle, you know, but what quite what happens quite often is people are adding Coke and lemonade and God knows what, pineapple juice into it and ruining it. And probably drinking it excessively and then blaming the whiskey. It's just not nice. No one wants to see that. The number two comment was that Johnny Walker Green Label is the best whiskey in the whole range from the red to the blue, without a doubt. It's And I concur. That's fantastic. 85, 90 bucks, depends where you buy. Very nice. A little bit smoke. Um, something else interesting, if you didn't know, is even though it's a blended whiskey, it's an all malt blend. So 
some of the single malts from the Diageo range go in there. Old malt, all made out of malted barley. There's no grain whiskey in there. So that's why probably it resonates with some of the people. The flavor is a little bit more robust. Um, they're just that much more nicer, if that makes sense. So no grain whiskey in there. And that touch of smokiness, you know, um, that obviously helps. I'll try and hold the box up, see if you can see it, you know. It sort of illustrates for you. And if you've got one at home, you can probably see for yourself, you know. You've got a bit of Talisker, Linkwood, Cragamore, and a little bit of Kalila to add that smoky character in there. Hmm. Hey, Ange, with better luck, watch the space. Um, for whatever reason, <laughs> I was very, very expensive, Glenn, <laughs> very expensive single malt collection of the Games of Throne, which I acquired at a huge cost, huge cost, including the Mortlock, is not selling. Because I think people in New Zealand right now, quite rightly, don't have $2,600 to sell. But we've got two of those seats in... As soon as this whole thing settles down a bit and we can open up, I'm intending on putting on a tasting with all three blends that were created for the Games of Thrones range and all nine single malts, so 10 whiskeys. And we'll do an epic, epic whiskey tasting. And we'll probably aim for Hamilton and Auckland, maybe maybe Taronga, because um, I don't think I can go to Wellington or Christchurch in any time soon because... Um, who knows what the AM is on a flight is going to be now. Um, I think we're all going to miss those 39 $4,900 deals. Um, let's see. What is uh, I like to see no eyes, like I need. Yeah, um, neat's good, but everyone has their own unique way of trying whiskey. Mmm. Very nice. So it's equal part sweetness. There's a little bit of peat. There's a little bit of smoke rising up. There's just a hint of spice. I mean, it's probably the best blend that's ever been created. Period. If money is no matter, because, you know, people like and, and they must drink. $45, $50 blends because, you know, um, you need to drink them on a regular basis. But that's just fantastic. And that could be anyone's cheer me up, give me a treat blend. Um, it's just amazing. And sorry, um, the last thing, <laughs> and this is going to be controversial, um, the last thing or the number three thing we got, got out of that Johnny Walker tasting was that the Johnny Walker Blue Label is ridiculously overpriced. And I'll just leave it there. Um, you can be, you can make your own judgment call on it, um, but that's that's what the feedback we got that night. Um, and if anything, you know, at eight p.m. every time we get messages, we get this message quite often, right? Hey, Ash, thinking of gifting someone something really expensive. I was thinking Johnny Blue. What do you think? And ninety-nine percent of the time, I end up convincing them to buy an amazing single cast whiskey, um, but quite often it's easy to gift Johnny Walker Blue because it is actually a very nice whiskey. And when you gift it to someone who's not all that knowledgeable or maybe not all that into whiskey, they know they've been gifted something very high quality, which is really desirable as well. So it's really good for the gifting market, but there is life well beyond the Johnny Walker Blue, especially that $240, 240 245 some very nice whiskeys that price point. Something else I want to touch on, which is quite important, you know, um, something that's talked about, especially for friends watching on Instagram, um, something that's talked about um, in New Zealand quite a bit is the binge drinking culture. You know, um, don't be shy to peel a bit of this in between. Um, if you don't want to, don't put it into the whiskey, but yeah. Don't be shy to drink a little bit of the water. I'd be very nice. Uh, Anch will make it happen, man. Um, 
trust me, it's going to happen because I want to review the whole set, all 10 of them. Um, it'd be interesting, especially the single malt. I'm quite intrigued. I've tried two or three of them. I don't remember. I was at a whiskey bar in Sydney amongst a million other things, so I don't remember much about them. But um, let's see. I'd bake, love that. Uh, top three single malts below 115 reasons why. <laughs> Bevan, I'd say blue is way too expensive. Yeah. Yeah, Johnny Walker Double Deck's quite nice, actually. It's probably kind of left alone a little bit. You know, it's not marketed heavily, I guess. So people buy the Johnny Walker Black. But the Double Black's quite nice. It's value for money 64 bucks. 60 bucks. All right, I'm going to answer. Bevan's cushion. What's your top three single malts below 150 and reasons why? So I'm assuming you're saying single malt scotch. Okay. Number one, Abelo, Abada. Uh, you probably can't see them. I've got over 18 of them. So if you haven't seen them already, Abelo, Abana, they come in different batches. Um, I've tried mostly from early 50s to 65 now, which we get. I was very lucky to get sent a sample bottle of the batch 27 by a lovely lady. I think it's Julie in Christchurch. So if you haven't seen it already, this is Abelo, Abena. Look at that color, natural color from the sherry cask. And they're always bottled at cask trend. So you're getting value because, you know, in New Zealand, we like value. Um, so you're getting a sherry cast whiskey bottle of cast strength that retail for 120 to 150 depending on which batch you're getting and they vary a little bit but the ABV is always around that 60 percent so you're kind of getting a bottle and a half and if you haven't experienced the full-on ride of Abena it's a ride worth taking you're going to get intense spice um, cinnamon dry fruits a bit of punch from the right hand and the left hand. The alcohol vapor is going to overpower you. But as all of that subsides very, very slowly, there will be a long hint of pepper and always followed by a little bit of sweetness of the sherry cask. Just beautiful. Um, I have found lately um, that Abelo, the newer cask releases, um, the more the pepper at the end, which is fine, I enjoy them. But um, I don't know why, maybe they're sourcing their barrels from somewhere else. So that's the number one I suggest. The number two, under 150 bucks, is Glenlivet 15 year old. Um, it was probably one of the most original single malts in the very early days I fell in love with, and it still retails for under 100 bucks. So that below your um, 150 threshold. I think Glenlivet 15 is one of the most fantastic single malts there ever will be. It's got that dry character of almonds and maybe a almonds, a little bit of hazelnut, and there's just a little bit of sweetness. And it's one of the very few whiskeys being closer to 40% ABV. I still really, really enjoy it. Um, and I mean, I'm a big fan of Glen Levitt. Um, prefer them wholeheartedly, the whole range. Um, the Glen Levitt 15, I think it's a little bit of magic. I don't know if you've tried it before. And number three, what would I say? Probably this beast here then, if I had to throw a smoky one in here. Um, that's the Lafroy PX cask. I don't know if you've seen it before. So how old is it? It's debatable, but it will be around the 10 years age. So kind of like the Lafroy 10 smoky PT intent. But they finish it in the PX cask, which adds a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of well-roundedness to it. And it's just beautiful. Definitely worth a try. All right. I'm going to have more whiskey. What am I going to have? What am I going to have? Should I do this? Do you want to take a guess what that is? Or while you guess, I will have a little bit of this instead. Cool. So this is Paul John from Goa um, in uh, India. Probably, do I prefer that over Amrut? Yeah, I prefer Paul John over Amrut. Not a lot of good single malt or 
variety of single malts coming out of India, obviously. Um, don't get me wrong. Um, if you didn't know this already, but um, India is the biggest consumer of whiskey, period, at all price points by sheer volume. Um, you know, there's just a lot of people and they love their whiskey. And if you couldn't tell already, I'm a full-blooded Indian. Um, I fought. I don't drink whiskey. I don't want to drink whiskey for a long time. But I think it's just in, <laughs> in Indian blood. It's just enjoyed at all levels, you know, from the really cheap Indian-made hooch to a little bit of Indian-made whiskey blended with a little bit of scotch or proper scotch or single malts or very, very expensive single malts. Um, it's all labels. But it's good to see people like Paul John and um, um, Amrut and there's the other one, Rampo, making interesting single malts. So this one here, um, what's special here is, you know, if you don't know, Goa is actually, you know, when I first heard that this whiskey is made in Goa, I kind of freaked out a bit because I've been there as a child once and it's so humid, um, you know. You would think it's kind of like a climate where you would make a rum maybe and it will come out really good. But um, they're making whiskey and the whiskey is aging very, very quickly. Um, don't quote me, but from memory, these are only five to six years old max. And the flavors they impart in that short period of time versus Irish or Scottish, or even American whiskeys, it's just intense. And this one is just, there's a distinct um, mint character, mint, yeah, on the nose. Hmm. See, it's just made me slow down. There's a lot happening on the nose. Mm. There's a bit of oak, there's a bit of sweetness. I mean, it's just magic. Everything I've drunk from Paul John has been just absolutely brilliant. There's a amazing mix of mocha and mint. It's bizarre. <laughs> it intrigues me. And these are cheap comparatively, um, 85 to 90 bucks. And we never sell any of these, never ever, which is beyond me. But um, I think it's because people are put off by two things. It's an Indian whiskey. And they're thinking if it's an Indian whiskey, they're thinking it should be 40, 45 bucks, like those really cheap entry level ones that sell in big numbers. But Paul John's are, you know, in UK, they are cleaning up. They're picking up some awards. <sighs> Beautiful nose. Mm. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Mm. quite intense actually which is not a lot but there's a lot going on in the palate mm. what are you guys up to in, in a circle hey Tim hey Ricky what's Ricky drinking Johnny Walker the Royal Salute ah oh, good choice mm. I agree Ollie Pogues <laughs> yeah Actually, um, I got gifted a Pogues single malt. Maybe I'll share a little bit of it with you, Doug. Uh, we're long overdue for catch up anyway, and thank you for your order earlier today. Um, no, I did not charge you three thousand dollars for your three hundred dollar whiskies. Um, that's for another gentleman who I have to catch up with first thing in the morning. More on that later. Um, and what are people on LinkedIn up to? Cool. Hi, Manny. Hmm, very interesting. 
this is a very nice whiskey for under 100 bucks, which we'd sell next to nothing of. I think we probably haven't sold one at all this year, which is bizarre. I don't understand it. Maybe we should do just a Paul John tasting and not tell anyone. We'll just say it's a bunch of Scotch whiskey. People will turn up and their minds will be blown. Mm. Oh. So what have we done so far? I've done an Irish whiskey, a South African, I've done a bourbon, I've done a Scotch blend, and I've done an Indian whiskey. Let's go to Taiwan. Sorry, I don't have a full bottle um, because I did not want to commit to opening a full bottle. But um, this is a V sample of Cavalan uh, from Taiwan. This is the Solace, which is their single cast range, bottle at cast range. And this is a whiskey being finished in a port cask. Look at that color. Everything I said about um, Paul John about being youngish whiskey, being aged in a hot, humid place, 100% applies to Kavalan as well, being made and um, aged in um, Taiwan, you know. Um, one thing, something you might find um, very interesting is, um, I've just got to frame it up nicely. What did Alan say? Taiwan, even though it's smaller in population, drinks scotch whiskey almost at as par as japan i think to that effect but i think what alan from the glen Levitt, alan winchester the master distiller what he's trying to say is demand for single malt scotch in taiwan is phenomenal and it's almost fitting that amazing uh whiskey is being made there now and um i mean for those of you who could come to other cavalan tasting that was in auckland in february Gosh, that seems a long time ago. That was a great night. Um, we had a lot of fun. Look at that color from the port cask. Can you see it? That's hypnotizing. Um, I don't remember top of my head um, what ABV this is, but it'd be closer to 57 to 60%. Very nice. When I mean, Kavlan is just magic, it's it's something else, and it's a discovery in itself that you need to have. Um, and that's where whiskey bars come handy. You know, if you have a good one close to you, try a few of the different ones without committing to um, a full bottle, because that's what I do quite often. Um, I don't want to open new bottles. There's too many here already. Um, but you know, you can go to Whiskey Barn for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 bucks. You can try something really interesting. This is going to be an attack of sensation. Watch this. Mm. <laughs> mm. So thick, you can chew into it. It's like a whiskey syrup. Can you hear me crackling? Mm. Wow. Hey, Maka, thank you for watching. I'm quite intrigued by that cigar you just commented about. We'll talk about that later. My wife might be watching the live. <laughs> But back to the Port Solace, oh, so powerful, but it's subtle at the same time. Um, it's very high in ABV, you know, nearly 60%. Oh, good. There's oak, there's a tiny bit of spice. There's cherries. Oh, ho, ho, ho. crackling. The same effect you can get from Abela, Abena as well, if you haven't experienced it already. Very good. If you want a good starting point in the Kavlan range, what I recommend do is 
never go towards the solace, which is the single cast class strength monsters that start at 240 to 250 dollars and they go up and up and up and um i will start at the new 150 to 200 dollar x sherry cask or x bourbon cask so i think the bourbon one is about 170 and the sherry one's about 200 amazing yes it will seem expensive you know a non eight stated 200 dollar sherry cask whiskey from taiwan but you can drink that with some conviction versus a whole heap of different scotch whiskeys which have been aged in sherry cask and it will stack up um i'll tell you a quick story um around the power of solace or the cavalan range um we did a gentleman's whiskey evening um in the auckland wide dog and i hope my mate john's watching because he loves when i tell the story because i tell a slightly different version of it <laughs> but um we did a big night you know we drank 35 year old single cast port allen from 1982 the teeling 24 year old we drank a 47 year old long moon um which is fantastic and we drank five other whiskeys and then all the gentlemen sat down to do a sherry cast challenge where four sherry cast whiskeys were tried without prior knowledge of where they're from what the price is or what sort of sherry cast they've been in and we all tried this and the four whiskeys that were there were a single cask blair rattle which actually i have here um it was this particular blair rattle so it was that particular blair rattle 23 year old sherry cask and i had entered this bad boy a 19 year old single cask the glen limit and there was a 14 year old port charlotte Brooklady sherry cask and number four was a cavalan fine oak sherry cask which retails for about 450 bucks but um there was 20 votes to be had and the cavalan got 15 out of 20. it was just it was yeah it was not like the election here you know there was no coalition it was just a clean sweep the cavalan cleaned up the three scotch whiskeys which I still drink, I enjoy them. Um, they're really, really good, but the Cavalan just sweep them aside. It was just, I think a lot of lessons were learned that night by a lot of the guys who profess to be whiskey connoisseurs, you know, like me. And I think we all learned a beautiful lesson that night. Cool. All right, who's watching? Mm, quite nice even through the water <laughs> you could taste the podcast all right i'm going to wrap it up with three more a kiwi a japanese and number three is going to be my whiskey of the year um which i named in my book the links there i just never get a chance to talk about my book because my book got published and this other guy named mr corona or covid whatever you want to call it, turned out at the same time. So I stopped talking about the book because there were matters at hand which were uh, much more severe. But the links there, for those of you who are interested, I wrote a book. It's not a big book, but it's an e-book. It's available on Amazon. It's not very expensive. It's only $5. But I've shared a lot of stories in there from last year. Um, all right. It wouldn't be fair to try or not to try a Kiwi whiskey um and by the way i'll put all the names up i'll put all the links up in comments on all of the channels later on so this one is the thompson ryan barley which is sort of like a mad experiment matt thompson's done and it's turned out really really good look at that color on it for a young whiskey that's just awesome isn't that fantastic beautiful Wow, really nice. I mean, I'm not really into making cocktails and neither am I into trying high-end cocktails, but you could do a lot, you can have a lot of fun with this. It's 
beautiful. It slows you down. For a young whiskey, it slows you down. Such a deep nose. It's quite fruity. Um, you can smell the rye. Hmm. Very nice. And it's interesting because uh, Matt's used rye and barley. Um, and I remember talking to him about it. This is a long time ago, probably two years ago, a year and a half ago. And he was telling me how difficult rye as a grain is to work with. Um, because during production, you know, it sticks everywhere. It's very hard to clean. But even then, he chooses to work with it. Um, so, I mean, there's beautiful flavors in there. Very interesting. I should try and do uh, try to do an old fashioned with it one day. It'd be worth it. Cool. Now, who has seen this bad boy before? Hakushu. Single box from Japan. All right. While you ponder and answer that question, I'm just going to have a quick round. Let's see what people are saying. Now, someone is commenting. I don't know which handle you're commenting on, sir, but I cannot see your name um, for some reason. Or ma'am. You could be a ma'am. I'm sorry. I think could be someone in a circle. What would be your top three cask whiskeys to try? Do you mean cask type or do you mean cask strength? Can you clarify? That's why I was wondering who's asked it because I can't see your name for some reason. Cool. What are you guys up to on 8 p.m.? Hi, Carl. Uh, have you tried the Glen Allerkey Vintage 2007? 12 year old port pipe matured, stunning gram, 58.7% ABV. No, Carl, I haven't, but I've got something really cool to show you, okay? Everyone else, go away. And this is only for Carl. Right, this is number one. I don't think you can read it. Glen Allerkey, single cast, 2011. Started life in a bourbon cast and they're finishing the sherry cast. And I picked this one up in an auction, a Glen Allerkey from 2008. Again, a single cask. Itchy. I should show you the bottles, probably. Look at that. Can you see me through it? I mean, both these whiskeys have been fantastic. And I've, um, I don't have too much out of them. But they have been fantastic. I'll do a full review on these. They are not for sale um, because I could only find one each. But that's the young one. And it's deeper in color. Figure that out. I don't know how to do that. But both of them were just full-on Christmas cake. Just amazing stuff. Cast strength. And Tim, what was your original cushion? I'll come back to it, Tim. I'm sorry. So let's do a Japanese whiskey. Um, I've been to Hakushu, luckily, around this time last year. I think end of May. Uh, what's today? Yeah, end of May I was in um, Japan. And I was lucky enough to go to Yamazaki and Hakushu and see for myself um, how are they making consistently such good whiskeys, you know, um, and the number one thing I learned <laughs> during my tours of Hakushu and Yamazaki was if you were to put a blindfold on me and take me away and bring back, you know, do a bit of trickery, remove all the signs in Japanese and remove all the, um, well, Japanese people, you would think you're in a Scotch whiskey distillery, 100%, because every method, you know, every step of production is exactly the same. And Japanese have no problems with it. You know, you know, tuck it through. 
the great father of Japanese whiskey industry, went to um, Scotland, obviously, learned the art, brought it with him, and then sort of grew from there. And it's just amazing. You know, all the barley that they're using is coming from Scotland. The stills, um, the mash tons, everything, the whole method. And it was interesting trying some of the older Hakushu there, which I can't find a bottle of, um, you know, like the 18 and some of the older stuff. So I can only afford to drink the entry level um, non age statement, which still retails for $200, which is a lot of money. Um, you can get some very nice single cast whiskeys for that kind of money. So this one's bottled at 43%, and they use slightly or lightly peated barley. Um, this is just hints of smoke in there, but otherwise, it's 100% a space side. Probably very similar to Glenlivet, I would say. Very light, very fresh, you know, sort of fresh cut grass, very light, very easy to drink. Mmm. Mmm. The smoke's amazing. <laughs> Why not? It's funny. <laughs> I mean, I could have laid 10 different glasses out. I didn't want to. I wanted to commit to drinking out of the same Denver and Riley. But some of the um, Kavalan podcast is coming through, which is quite good. I've created a blend of sorts, haven't I? The fresh, light, smoky Hakushu with hands of port. That's quite nice. Hopefully, someone from Hakushu is watching and they can do a, a podcast finished blend. <laughs> That's quite tasty. I'm going to go to good rinse for the last one because that that whiskey I want to try the full on flavors. All right. What are people saying? Does anyone have any more questions? Please, more than happy to answer them or try to. Yeah, Bevan, uh, please get your hands on um, Abelo, cast thread if you can, please. Mm. I'm sorry, but I can't see comments from um, in the circle. They are hindered a bit. All right, one more whiskey to go. Now, um, as I mentioned before, um, I wrote a book. I don't know if you call it a book. It's it's like a journal. Um, and the idea for the book came from my Instagram handle because I went through these photos from last year on my Instagram handle. And then I was looking at some of the photos from my Samsung phone's gallery. I was thinking to myself, man, I did quite a lot. I mean, I traveled a lot in name whiskey, doing tastings or visiting distilleries or meeting people, going to whiskey festivals and all of that kind of stuff. And I thought it'd be kind of cool to try and narrow down a moment in each month that sort of, you know, I tried something so unique in terms of whiskey that really blew my mind. And luckily or unluckily, I tried far too many interesting whiskeys. And it was so hard to pick a particular moment. And I mean, I've never written a book before and I had no desire to write a book. So wasn't really sure what I'm doing, but in the book, I picked one moment um, in each month. I'm going to try something so good that it's kind of made me stop and go, this is something really special. And I called the book, you know, 12, <laughs> 12 plus one drams that I found really interesting in 2019. The reason why it's 12 plus one is because um, 
in one month in particular, I couldn't narrow it down to one, so I had to pick two because they were both so phenomenal. Um, but you know, the books there, I think I um, put it live in end of February or early March, and um, it's there. I mean, the link's there if you want to have a bit of read. But um, then a thought came to mind that. You know, I see a lot of these other guys who've been talking about whiskey for so long, and I admire them. I thought, you know, I'll try and name something as my whiskey of the year. Um, you know, a particular whiskey that I found mind blowing, and my one and only criteria for this particular thing was that money is no matter because, luckily, because of what I do, I'm exposed to some very expensive whiskey, some very cheap whiskeys. And a lot in the middle. So I was going to pick something that I truly enjoyed and blew my mind because don't get me wrong, if you read the book, I've drunk out of $10,000 bottles as well. They were really, really nice, but I didn't pick that as my whiskey of the year. Um, instead, I picked this one, which is the Ben Reac single cask 1995 Oloroso sherry cask, peated. Quite a mouthful, right? Should I do it again? I'll do it again. Ben Reac single cask. Cast friend, um, Oloroso Sherry Cast Peated from 1995. This is cast number 7383, 22 year old. Oh, I've got more bottles of this. Um, because I've one thing I learned from um, a gentleman, um, who shall remain nameless is if you're going to name something as your whiskey of the year, make sure you stash several bottles, especially when it's a single cask. I mean, this one is. It's not a big release, only 563 bottle release worldwide. So I stashed a good 19 bottles of ice so I can sip on them very, very slowly. But I was just trying to show you the color from the cask. It's just dark. Look at that. You know, I asked the other day somewhere, you know, if, um, if color matters. It does matter if it's going to be natural. That's natural color. And it's just absolutely hypnotizing, you know. It's just beautiful. I'll show you the color again in the glass. But look at that. That's just liquid dark chocolate. And that's 100% from being for 22 long years in an Oloroso sherry cask. <laughs> what did I call it? The first time I noticed it. Um, it's like melting a bar of your favorite dark chocolate and putting it just a little bit of salted caramel on top. And that's what you get from this. It's dark chocolate. So good. <laughs> Very nice. I mean, I actually, have I reviewed it? I don't think I've reviewed it for my YouTube channel. Maybe I should. If I've done it, I'll re-review it. Um, because I'm falling more and more in love with it. I mean, if you ask me, and I think that's what Tim was trying to ask before. One thing I like, um, hi, Robert. And I hope you're good, buddy. Um, the number one thing I'm enjoying in whiskeys is long age, you know, 15 to 20 years. A little bit longer, but not too long. Uh, peated, because as my palate's maturing, I'm seeking more and more of that smoky, peaty character and sherry cask. And for me, this is marriage made in heaven. It's a 22-year-old. It's a single cask. It's at cask strength, so no water added. It's a beautiful color. It is sherry cask, so it has that sort of dry fruit. It has a bit of spice, and it's peated. It's just marriage made in heaven. And I haven't quite found, at least in the last year or since then, Anything that comes even remotely close to it. The only other one I can think of, which is in the book as well, is this bad boy, which could, you know, if there was going to be like a, a runners up version. Um, this is the 22 year old Pedro Jimenez cask, bottled at 46%, I think. And that's the only thing that was holding it back. Truly fell in love with long age Ben React whiskeys. And I prefer that one for one reason only. 
that it's left alone and it's natural calf strength, which is so important. And as some of you are getting on your whiskey journey, you will you will start to appreciate the calf strength. You know what I mean? You've got to leave whiskey alone. Don't have water. Don't add ice. If you have to add it, I won't judge you, but that's beautiful. <laughs> mm. It's just a treat. Hey, Anch. I don't know. I generally don't know. This is not all of it. There's stuff in the garage, and there's. <laughs> I don't want to say too much. There's a lot. Can't be cherry or red wine cast. Peter's just next little epic. I agree, Ollie. Hey, look. I think I've given a lot of my time quite generously. Um, I hope you learned something. Um, I've enjoyed all of these whiskeys. All of the whiskeys I've tried during the video, I truly admire. They are from different countries. Uh, really, really good. Problem we have is the Baines from South Africa. It's the only South African whiskey I've tried. Maybe there's more to discover. If you know of some, put them in the comment. I will happily try some. Send me a sample. Um, happy to take samples. There's a bookshelf <laughs> full of samples waiting to try. We can add more. It's okay. Hopefully, I'll catch up with some of you, some of you guys soon. Because um, last year, um, on my flight back from Japan, I came up with the idea of 8 p.m. winter tour, you know, which was going to have six of my favorite whiskeys um, featuring in there, which was amazing. We did 19 events, and that also is up in the air at the moment. I haven't thought too much about it because there's so much uncertainty around COVID. Um, but if you think that's something that could work, wherever you are in New Zealand, contact us. I would love to get back on the road again. If anything, I'm desperate to get back on the road and start doing some tastings because I love doing them and I love meeting people, you know, who drink whiskeys at all levels. You know, it could be a Johnny Walker Red or it could be a $4,500 Port Allen single cast or somewhere in the middle, a $400 single cast Ben Riach. Um, but we'll see what happens with the tastings. Um, Hopefully we can start doing them soon. Um, I would love to. I'd love to do the winter tour again, um, but we'll see. All right, I better go. Thank you for watching. Um, I'll reply to more comments in the morning. I'll put up all of the whiskeys I've tried. Um, I'll try to give you links to them so you can look up tasting notes and all that kind of stuff. Otherwise, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Salanche, Salanche, to your good health. Um, Keep fighting COVID, you know, be strong. As a country in New Zealand, we've done really well um, to fight this situation, but now we need to kind of move past it a little. Um, and a solid, solid dram, I'm no doctor, keeps a lot of the diseases away. Don't quote me on this. Talk to your doctor first. All right, good night.